Thanks for coming. Uh, I, I'm happy to uh, to give a stand-up talk. I've done a bunch of these on this topic uh, in recent years at a bunch of different places, but I'm probably more interested in having a discussion. So I'm going to I'm going to start a talk and go for a little while. But I'd, I'd be pleased if you would stop me, uh, raise questions, make uh, points, interject comments along the way or take the discussion in a direction that would be uh, useful for you. Uh, targeted killing is uh, it's nasty business, however it's performed. Uh, for the U.S. government, the pace of targeted killings has, of course, increased dramatically. In the last few years, uh, in the Obama administration, and, and the use of these uh, sophisticated drones and their technology became sort of a contemporary weapon of choice for responding to terrorists and insurgents who would cause civilian deaths. Using the technology and the weaponry, I think, makes it incumbent upon us to see to it that the weapons and their use are subject to a tightly managed and accountable set of legal controls that are as transparent as possible. I suppose that's as close to a thesis statement as, uh, as I can uh, come, and, and I'll uh, come back to that a little bit uh, later. I do have some slides here. Uh, that I've, I've used that uh, might generate some discussion and maybe we can work from those. I did bring the last week's DOJ white paper and I've spent some time looking at that. We can talk about that. We can talk about the, the uh, recent suggestion that courts be somehow involved in this targeting approval uh, process. We can talk about anything you like. Here's some uh, pretty divergent comments on the use of this weapon. Now, of course, Mr. Panetta is uh, just getting out from under the Department of Defense, but when he was CIA director, he uh, he called uh, drones the most precise and discriminating weapon system in the history of warfare. I suppose Panetta was not known for understatement, and that's not uh, understatement, but it's out there. My friend and colleague, Mary Ellen O'Connell at Notre Dame, is, is uh, not a fan of uh, what the United States has been doing with the uh, targeted killing and drones. There simply is no right to use military force against a terrorist suspect far from any battlefield. We can come back to her uh, view. She had an op-ed in the New York Times just the other day reiterating the same points in response to Mr. Brennan's testimony and his confirmation hearings to be CIA director. And then here's the ICRC. Use of a drone to strike suspect, suspected terrorists in Yemen. The Yemen case was a 2002 case, I'll comment on that one. They call it an extrajudicial killing that was likely a murder under domestic law. Well, they're pretty divergent points of view. Here are the two uh, systems most often discussed and most commonly in use today, the Predator and the Reaper. Predator has been around longer, started as a surveillance uh, uh, vehicle. Our technology in the mid-90s, actually in the Balkans, made its way into Iraq and, and Afghanistan. It was weaponized uh, after 9-11. The Reaper is a longer range, it's bigger, it has uh, uh, more uh, more firepower uh, capable of being mounted on it uh, and can fly uh, a little bit longer at a little bit higher altitude. We could talk about the technology, I don't know uh, much more about the technology than that some of you in the, in the room may. Um, it, it is important, it seems to me, to talk about terms. Since we're lawyers and we uh, care about language, it's, uh, it's often the case that in these debates, uh, language is used pretty loosely. Uh, my my co-author and I uh, tried a, a simple definition 10 years ago 
part of killing is a premeditated killing of an individual by a government or its agents. We, we weren't thinking of drones when we wrote that. Um, we were thinking of the, in the old cloak and dagger kind of, uh, of killings that sometimes have gone on uh, in, in our history and in world history. And Gary Solis, who, who's at, at Georgetown Law School, was thinking of drones, so he used a few more words uh, to say something pretty similar. Intentional killing of a specific civilian or unlawful combatant who cannot be reasonably apprehended is taking a direct part in hostilities, the targeting done at the direction of the state in the context of an armed conflict. That's a pretty fulsome definition. And it might be a good one to use. Uh, I think going forward, we could come back to this if we uh, if we debate uh, some aspects later. And if you if you did manage to take a look at the DOJ white paper last week, you you'd see that their uh, language and their argument is patterned after the criteria that Solis referred to in his definition. Finally, it's important, I think, to distinguish targeted killing from assassination. Even, even well-intended people sometimes use the terms interchangeably. They're not. Assassination is always unlawful. It's simply unlawful killing. There's a provision in U.S. law that many of you have heard about, and many of, some of you may have studied it, in an executive order that was promulgated by President Reagan 1981 forbids United States involvement in assassination. That rule is still on the books. It's an executive order, not a statute. It can be changed, all the right. There's been debates about whether it's been waived from time to time. <clears throat> targeted killing is not assassination. Targeted killing is governed by various legal considerations, many of which are containing these definitions and in some forms of positive law that we can try uh, going forward. Uh, there are a lot of things going on. Uh, I've been fooling with these slides again lately. I've given versions of this talk uh, uh, for years, but uh, uh, this week uh, when, uh, when, when Parker and Mora got to me the other day and asked if I had time this week to do something, I spent some more time updating them. It, I guess I wrote this first bullet point earlier. It, it is sort of the, the Star Trek technology idea, isn't it? Part of what is so uh, challenging and, and upsetting to many people about this uh, problem is the, is the high tech uh, nature of the, of the weapon system. But I think more, at least something that's more in my comfort zone, uh, uh, there are a lot of pressure points in both international and domestic law. <coughs> Some of them at the intersection of international and domestic law. As you know, the drone strikes that have occurred in recent years have occurred outside of so-called hot battlefields, outside of Afghanistan, outside of Iraq. They've occurred in Pakistan, they've occurred in Yemen, they've occurred in Somalia, they've occurred in Libya, perhaps in some other places. What's the scope of the battlefield? To what extent does geography define the parameters of the lawful use of a weapon system, whether we're talking about a drone strike or something else. Who are the permissible targets? As you all know, in the asymmetric world in which we live, the use of force by the United States in many different places and situations in the years since 9-11 has been against non-state actors, terrorists, insurgents, those who don't wear uniforms with insignia, identifying themselves, carrying arms openly, uh, reporting to a chain of command, and so on. Now, uh, we've got the special problem here, of course, of dealing with the possibility that these strikes might be carried out against the United States citizens. There's been a lot of attention given to that, particularly since the strike that killed uh, a man named Alwaki about a year and a half ago. Um, we, we can talk about that. Another one, as if we didn't have problems enough so far, who's in charge? Who's going to carry out these operations? Who says shoot? There's been uh, a lot of controversy 
independent of the rest of these questions over the rel relative roles of the military and the intelligence community. Some of these strikes have been carried out by the United States military, others have been carried out by the CIA, some have been carried out in a joint operation. Well, for lawyers who, who are in the know here, there are difficulties in uh, finding the authorities that would permit two different entities to be involved at different times, to identify the limits on those authorities, to concerns about the nature of the, uh, of the training and orientation that intelligence operatives may have in relation to military personnel in carrying out these strikes, and also in terms of what laws apply should they behave unlawfully, what rules apply to the CIA as opposed to the military. Then there's the whole efficacy point, which may be the most important question. Are these, are these good things or bad things? Are they making matters better or worse? Uh, what do we do about casualties? What do we do about the, uh, the assertion that the effect of this technology is to simply to create more insurgents or more terrorists rather than uh, uh, that elimination? The, the, the story almost uh, took off in a hurry right after 9-11 because on the first night of the campaign in Afghanistan in October of 2001, there was a drone hovering not too far from Kabul, and through their photography and imaging, they were able to detect below someone who they thought, based on description, might have been the Supreme Mullah, Muhammad Omar, head of the Taliban. Given the importance of that sighting, the commanders who were looking at the, or the personnel who were uh, controlling the, the technology uh, sought upstream approval before any weapon would be used in that case. Uh, there had been in place at the time a sort of chain of command agreement from the CIA, which was operating that particular drone, up to Central Command and eventually to the White House. They went quickly back to Florida to CENTCOM and they got approval. Then they had to find the president. Took a while to find the president. We're talking a period of hours here, four, five, six hours from the time of the initial sighting. The president said go. But by the time they got back to the drone, the party that had been in place down there on the ground in Kabul had moved inside the building. They still thought it was probably Omar, but now instead of just Omar and maybe a couple of guards or other personnel, he was in a building with probably 80 or 100 other people. Commander said, we can't shoot. Too many civilians in the way. So he missed an opportunity because of the delay. Eventually, there was an approval to get to strike with conventional aircraft. By that time, Omar had left the premises and the building was taken down and I had some civilians were killed. What happened then was uh, uh, the first strike that actually uh, affected a casualty with a drone occurred in Yemen. This is, uh, this is the source of the quote that I showed a couple slides back. This guy, al Harethi, had been followed by the United States for a couple of years uh, since his alleged role as a mastermind of the bombing of the USS Cole in Yemen in 2000. Uh, he, was, he was traveling in the Yemeni desert, far away from any populated place. He was in a vehicle with five others. Um, the drone and the missile, Hellfire missile, was fired from it, essentially vaporized. Uh, the vehicle, all the occupants of the vehicle were killed. One of the five passengers turned out to be a United States citizen from uh, Tonawanda, New York, a suburb of Buffalo. Our left was killed. Was that a battlefield? Certainly not. <clears throat> Fast forward. The Bush administration used the, the mechanism of drone strikes to very seldom over the course of its two terms. I think the total number were, was in the 30s. By the time of the Obama administration, of course, the insurgency had changed. We're more or less out of, uh, of Iraq. Uh, the, the war in Afghanistan had become a cross-border war in Pakistan. 
Al Qaeda has begun to develop significant capabilities in Yemen. AQAP, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, also uh, through Al Shabaab in Somalia. Uh, you see what Panetta said in 2009. Again, uh, not a man prone to understatement. <clears throat> And you see, uh, after the three years in the Obama administration, a poll taken last year showing overwhelming public support. When do 83% of Americans agree about anything? <laughs> really quite stunning. Uh, <clears throat> one of the strikes that I think begins to illustrate some of the difficulties that, that uh, we have uh, as lawyers with this occurred in 2009. And, uh, Pakistan. This guy Massoud was the leader of the Pakistan Taliban. And if you follow this conflict at all, you know there are branches of the Taliban in Afghanistan and Pakistan. There are sects between them. There are groups and subgroups. Well, this sect had been terrorizing Pakistani government for years. Lots of kidnapping, suicide bombings. They may have been involved. Probably were involved in the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Bhutto, and they had also crossed the border to engage in attacks on U.S. military personnel in Afghanistan. We had him spotted, and he was killed by a Hellfire missile fired from a drone in August of 2009. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the shot was fired from Langley, Virginia. Uh, Masood was actually reclined on the roof of his father-in-law's home in Waziristan uh, while he was receiving what uh, looked like either a blood transfusion or, uh, or kidney dialysis. He was, he was ill. He was killed along with uh, members of his family and, uh, and a few uh, bystanders. There was a, a great reaction to the Masood strike. From some quarters, it was regarded as one of the most significant tactical victories in the campaign in Afghanistan and Pakistan since 2001. He was a bad guy. He was a mastermind of a lot of Taliban activities across the board. Others said it was a murder. Here was an innocent guy receiving a blood transfusion or a kidney dialysis sitting on his father-in-law's house surrounded by his family. Why didn't we go in and arrest him? <clears throat> he was in Pakistan, not Afghanistan. At the time, very few people claimed that the United States was engaged in an armed conflict in Pakistan, noting that we were in Afghanistan. The shooter, <clears throat> it was the CIA that pulled the trigger this time, not the United States military. Was it an assassination or a targeted threat? Were we engaged in an armed conflict? Was he a combatant or was he perhaps a civilian taking direct part in the hospital? Pause there for those of you unfamiliar with the basic framework of, the, of international humanitarian law or the laws of armed conflict. The basic dichotomy in the laws of armed conflict for persons is that you're either a civilian or a combatant. The word is simple. If you're a civilian, you must be protected. You can't be harmed. If you're concerned, you can be shot. The only uh, exception to that basic dichotomy is that if you are a civilian, quote, taking direct part in hostilities, that is, if you're not wearing a uniform, if you look like any of your neighbors, but you're engaged in fighting against the state uh, that's engaged in the armed conflict and can be regarded he can be a uh, lawfully uh, target. The student was certainly not wearing a uniform and did not identify himself as a combatant, but was <coughs> arguably taking direct part in hostilities. From the United States' point of view, what began to happen in 2009, at about the time of the Masood strike, is the development of uh, more detailed uh, legal support for the notion that the United States could undertake these strikes outside the so-called hot battlefields in affecting our national self-defense. The, the, the theory was and is, if you read the white paper last week, that the, that the geographic boundaries of the 
conflict against Al Qaeda, its affiliates, and those who uh, spin off from it, is not defined by uh, geography, but defined by what they do. And if we are able to identify an operational leader of, uh, of such a group uh, in a place where he can be uh, targeted uh, without significant risk of civilian casualties and where capture or arrest is not feasible, this is an important ingredient, then the legal authority may be found in the law of self-defense. The source of that law is partly international law and partly domestic law. That international law derives from the United Nations Charter, Article 51, which is, uh, is the only exception to, uh, other than Security Council authorization, the only exception to the rule that you can't cross a sovereign border uh, to use uh, force without the consent of that uh, state. In domestic law, the self-defense rule springs from the president's authority as the commander-in-chief uh, and part of his constitutional authority to fight defensive wars. The idea being that the, the concept of defensive war has evolved over time and that it's now uh, one that must take into account uh, asymmetric uh, characteristics of warfare and the realities <laughs> that uh, enemies that will be uh, combating are not those who we would traditionally find on the battlefield from a pending isolated uh, place. You, you uh, probably know, generally I won't belabor this, but the, the war in Afghanistan <coughs> was actively occurring in Pakistan at that time and has since then in these various regions here. Um, it's, uh, well, to go back, it, it, the, the red line uh, meant very little in those regions that were identified uh, inside the, the green uh, highlighted area. Uh, some of the accounts of drone strikes in those areas that I think are most uh, uh, useful to read are not written by lawyers, they're written by journalists. There's a guy named David Rohde, R-O-H-D-E, New York Times reporter, who was over there covering the Aryan was captured by the Taliban and was held, I don't know, six months. He spent a good deal of time there and escaped, uh, fortunately, to, to tell the story. He's got a book. He heard the drones. He saw the impact of the strikes. And he's, uh, it would be fair to say he's conflicted uh, about their efficacy. Uh, his reading is good. Uh, Peter Bergen has written some stuff about strikes in this area. You can probably know Bergen from CNN, but he's got a lot of written stuff in, in book material as well as uh, out on the web and at the New American Foundation. When we go outside, are we doing all right? Am, am I covering things that are worth covering? Anybody want to stop me so far? I've just got a few more slides. All right. <clears throat> when we go outside that area, here we were in 2011 in Somalia. We used drones to wound senior members of Al-Shabaab, which is an affiliate of Al-Qaeda in the Horn of Africa. Uh, in Yemen, again, the, the uh, Al-Qaeda presence had, had grown. Uh, we're going to talk about Al-Walki separately in just a moment. Uh, the Yemen situation is still active. Drones have been fired in, in Yemen in 2013. I forget the count. I don't keep track. Then, of course, when we had our military operation in Libya uh, two year, less than two years ago, we, uh, we used uh, drones to target Qaddafi uh, forces that were believed to be attacking civilians inside Libya. We could talk separately about the lawfulness of the Libya operation if you like. That's kind of an interesting story. Here's a scorecard. The Obama administration has authorized five times as many drone strikes in four years as the Bush administration ordered in eight years. Five times, I don't know, you can do the arithmetic. Lots. Accuracy is apparently increased depending on whose data you respect and who you regard as a credible source. Somewhere between 85 and 95 percent of those killed are militants. In the Obama, New Year, Obama years, up, uh, some 
from the Bush era strikes. Uh, the civilian casualty numbers are somewhere between 100 and 1,000. That's a dramatic uh, difference, of course. And there are lots of ways for you to vet those reports uh, and take a look at the ones you regard as most credible. What's been the impact uh, uh, of the drone strikes on the insurgency in Al Qaeda and on the local populations most affected? That's a critically important question, of course. <clears throat> Building the Obama administration's legal case has been an interesting thing to observe, uh, particularly for those of us uh, who, who have been steeped in this area for a while. Uh, Mr. Coe, who stepped down just in the last couple of weeks as the legal advisor to the State Department, just to, uh, I think he's returning uh, to the classroom, he uh, really began to stake out the legal arguments in uh, at the ASIL conference uh, three years ago. Um, he, he made this talk knowing that it would be uh, widely followed, and, uh, and, and I think it uh, continues to be sort of the backbone of administration policy. We can target those who are planning attacks high-level of Qaeda leaders. Each strike is analyzed based on considerations specific to each case, including the rela those related to imminence. Imminence is an important criteria if you read the white paper last week. The sovereignty of other states involved, and the willingness and ability of those states to suppress the threat of the Parker, how do they define imminence? <clears throat> The white paper last week, it's a good question. I think I flagged it here. You can, you know about the DOJ white paper? A couple of clicks on Google will get it for you. And you don't have to get the NBC News version with their logo every three inches. You can get the <laughs> plain version now. Uh, imminence. Well, let me, let me look. Here we go. An informed high-level U.S. official must have determined that the targeted individual poses an imminent threat of violent attack against the United States. An informed high-level U.S. official. If you... The guy who called me from the Times the other day, uh, Scott Shane, was on uh, Fresh Air last night with Terry Gross, was driving somewhere and listened to him for a little while. And, and, and Scott reminded us of something that has been written about by others. President Obama personally probably approved more than a third of the drone strikes in the first three years of his administration. There was always a high level informed U.S. official involved. Second, said the white paper, it must be concluded that capturing the targeted individual is infeasible. Well, Parker, you could have asked about the meaning of that term. Third, the operation would be conducted in a manner consistent with applicable law of war principles. Attention to minimizing civilian casualties, ensuring that the gains of the operation are proportionate to its risks. Um, imminent is is the uh, is the key criterion here. The condition that an operational leader presents an imminent threat of violent attack against the United States does not require the United States to have clear evidence that a specific attack will take place in the immediate future. Now. That sounds like imminent doesn't mean imminent. <laughs> Let me repeat that sentence. The condition that an operational leader presents an imminent threat of violent attack against the United States does not require the United States to have clear evidence that a specific attack will take place in the immediate future. So before I read that, I thought I knew what imminent meant. <laughs> I'm not so sure that I agree that. Now, that's not just mumbo-jumbo. Why do you suppose they would have put, the, uh, put that language in there? 
what they get them. What's the difficulty with being a minimum criteria in a situation like this? Why can't you be more concrete? Well, that the planning and coordination of an attack on the United States could be years out from when it's supposed to happen. That's one possibility. What's another? I was going to say just the simple proximity from whatever action he's doing to the attack is impossible to decide. That's true, too. Maybe. Imminence is a <clears throat> quagmire. <clears throat> and, and you're dealing, of course, with a technology and weaponry that virtually instantaneous. But you're dealing with a milieu that is incredibly murky and difficult to pin down. Persons whose identity is very hard to fix, whose roles may shift from day to day, from person to person, which are very hard to track. Go ahead. But just to counter that again, I mean, in a war, unlike in criminal law, you, you don't need weapons, you just need a combatant. You don't need a combatant who is doing an action that will directly cause or approximately cause. A, a harm, you just need to take combat. Yeah, that's a nice point. In, in, in the laws of war, the, the wrinkle there is that if you're dealing with a non traditional combatant, and we are, those who don't wear uniforms, etc., who, who may be treated as a civilian taking a direct part in hostilities, <coughs> may have uh, an opportunity to be immunized from attack when he goes home for dinner. Paris by day, family man at night. I'm being a little bit flippant here, but I'm just trying to make a point. The, the interpretation of civilian taking direct part in hostilities has been characterized over the years by the ICRC and some others in a customary law of war manual as requiring a continuous <coughs> combat function, CCF. So if you modify civilian taking direct part in hostilities with the, at, with the qualifier of also being continuously engaged in a combat function, not the occasional shooter, then you've got a little more clarity to who you can target and who you can. Masood, the guy on his father-in-law's house, he's a bad actor. You've been responsible for ordering a lot of attacks. Yes, sir. I was wondering about the case of Abdul Rahman Alawaki, who's the he's the 16-year-old son of Anwar Alawaki. He's an American citizen, targeted in September of 2011. And um, as far as I know, the only statement made from the administration about it was Robert Gibbs, who um, <coughs> chopped up his death to him being the son of a suspected Al-Qaeda militant. My recollection of that strike, it was not the same strike that killed his father. It was another strike a couple of weeks later mm -hmm. that he was uh, a bystander. He was not the target of the strike, but was killed in a strike that, that was aimed at someone else. I'm not aware of that. When Robert Gibbs was talking about it, he, he didn't mention that he was a bystander. Yeah. Well, we got, I, so I don't know is the answer then. That's, that's my recollection, but I have looked at the facts of that case very closely. So would he be considered a civilian? The son? Yes. Yeah. I think it is my understanding of it, that is he was an innocent bystander. He wasn't targeted. Could not have been targeted. Simple relationship to, uh, to someone who we can characterize as a combatant doesn't make that person a combatant. So, so what's the... What's the penalty for, for the mistake? Uh, well, that's a good question. Where, where could the shooter be sanctioned? Fair question. I can't help being a law professor. I've got to ask questions. It's in my, in my genes. Could you sanction him? Yeah. As long as it was a legitimate military target that was targeted, is it missing bystander and just a casualty of war, and therefore not sanctioned? be the case. So long as there was a lawful strike. Would his, would his family have had a claim against the United States in some way for the wrongful death? 
Maybe. In which courts? In the ICC. Well, not against the United States and the International Criminal Court. We don't go there. <laughs> Maybe in the International Court of Justice, but that's a court only for states. How about in a federal district court, wherever jurisdiction can be had? Yeah, I think so. It's possible. Possible. I mean, the whole, I'm not a lawyer, I have no training. Uh, the whole uh, the whole concept of law is uh, you know, they have an adversary and people are the accused of the right to uh, you know face the accuser and present alternate evidence. Yeah. So I mean, uh, what the hell has happened to our law? I mean, that, uh, you know the. Uh, uh, you know, well, what has happened to it? I mean, what's, uh, you know, we are all, if, some, if my neighbor says I'm a terrorist, uh, uh, how do I surrender to a drone? Yeah. I think you're getting at one of the real core efficacy questions that's on the table now, and, and we can talk about it. Uh, that, I think the, the reporter that came to me last week called basically with that question in mind, could we involve a court somehow to make this process more law-driven? A court that would somehow be involved in reviewing the coordinates of the target list or the identity of the, of the target in advance. Would that make it better? Would that return a measure of propriety to the process that goes along with these uh, well, what's happened to the system that we have had since 17, whatever, 17, yeah. 70, whatever? Yeah. Um, you know, what's wrong with that system? Well, look, some others here should join in that conversation. <laughs> yeah? I'd argue it's not a new argument. We had cruise missiles before we had drones, and we had micro rifles before we had cruise missiles, all of which were long range weapons and not always striking in hot battles, obviously. I'd argue it's just a continuation and a new technology that has the same result. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different technology, it's more high speed, it's more uh, uh, remote. Uh, the targeting is, uh, can be done, as you see, from, from, a, from a conference room in, uh, in Syracuse, New York, or Langley, Virginia, or somewhere else, instead of in proximity to the target. But you'd argue that it's still an implement of fighting war. A new implement, but I, the, the whole idea that these legal issues all of a sudden just occurred now, I, I don't think is true. I think you know, these legal implications have been happening you know, since we started throwing rocks instead of throwing punches. So. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I would also say that terrorism is a little different than normal crimes. With most crimes, we wait for them to commit it and then we punish. Whereas with terrorism, especially in the age of nuclear weapons, I don't think we can necessarily wait for them to do something before we react. Because of the nature of the harm that can be inflicted. Well, so I was just, well, it, it, to kind of answer him about how do you surrender to a drone, I think maybe we need to consider uh, avenues of notice. Um, I don't know how many of the kill list in the White House is public knowledge. We don't have to reveal how we acquire that information, but if we put individuals on notice that they are on the list, maybe they have a chance to surrender. In you know, Alwaki's case, that was effectively done, wasn't it? It was done in the media. You, you, so those of you who follow this, remember that his father filed a lawsuit before he was killed, seeking to, in court, to enjoin an, an operation that had not yet occurred. And the court refused to hear the case, that is, they turned down jurisdiction on the grounds that his father lacked standing to sue. The court essentially said that he's, the father's not being injured by this alleged U.S. action that the son may be, and if the son wishes to, he could file the lawsuit. He didn't. Uh, but the, the, the court essentially acknowledged that such an operation may well, uh, may well occur. 
What do you think about the, the citizenship idea? Does that change the equation here? You forget about Masood, the guy sitting on his father-in-law's house in Waziristan. What about a walkie? Yeah? Well, I think it makes a difference um, who's carrying out the strike, whether it's the CIA or the military. Because if it is a U.S. citizen and it's the CIA, it's not necessarily a military action that's taking place. It's a civilian action. And maybe that should trigger some kind of more stringent due process than just the president or a high-level official reviewing the situation. There's an interesting argument that it matters who's shooting <clears throat> in this case, even though the, the, the authorization's been given by senior administration official, as the white paper suggests. The rest of you agree with that? Would you approach it differently? Would you do something different before an approval is given to put an American citizen on the, on the kill list or to just approve the, the fire order? Yeah. On well, September, uh, right after September 11th, the United States declared that all members of Al-Qaeda are Treat, not treasonous, but front the United States, and it to join them would be akin to treason. So I have no seen why the second you pick up that mantle, you are still protected by our laws. You are a traitor to the United States, and I would think you would lose your status as any protection that is immunized by our citizens. Who disagrees? Yeah. If you try, you still have to try someone for treason. So the facts matter. Yeah. And there has to be an opportunity then for the, the targeted person to contest the determination that the United States has made yeah. in advance of the strike? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Doesn't do much good afterwards, right? <laughs> how would you do it? Do you have an idea about how this might be done? Do you like the court idea? Yeah, I like you brought that. <laughs> I like the process too. Mark? I say, I've always thought that maybe they could use something like the FISA court in this context to, you know, take all the facts into account that the government has. I'm talking if they're targeting a U.S. citizen and then issue some type of, for lack of a better phrase, like death warrant for that individual, just to make sure they need some standard of proof to say that, yes, it seems this guy is an imminent threat or whatever. Say a little bit more about how that might work. Can you envision the process? Uh, I need some more time to think about it, but, yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't know, I think they'd follow something, like, Harold Coe wrote that um, speech to West Point, I think, right? Yeah. And there he laid out what, like, the elements they look for before they target someone. So I think they could work through each one of those, maybe, and just make sure that the government needs some type of clear and convincing or something, adequate amount of proof for each one of those. And, and I mean, one of the most important would obviously to make sure that it is true that capture is infeasible of this person. The, the problem with the whole idea, though, is the fact that I mean, they might see this guy by himself in the middle of the street, right, and have to take action there, or they're going to lose him for months. So the imminence factor has different faces. Right. Um, when we think about due process and we think about <laughs> fairness, we think about judicial fora, we think about an adversarial staking out of positions. You want to know because he's a citizen, is he really a bad guy? What's the problem? One of the problems with the idea of providing a judicial forum, where's the target going to be? Not in court. Not making his case. Is he going to be represented? How would he be represented if he doesn't know that he's a target? Corey? I mean, can't you just have the government appoint a lawyer? The people have lawyers appear for them in court all the time. You appoint somebody to represent a target who he's not met or interviewed? Well, I mean, it seems better than just having a bunch of people that are 
targeting this person to decide whether the person lives or dies. Uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which is the model that's been discussed here recently for how this might work, is a wholly one-sided affair. The targets of surveillance don't know that they're targets. Think about it. It would defeat the purpose of the mechanism. The targets of surveillance are not represented before the FISA court. The court makes the decision after looking at all the information before it. As Mark Johnson said a moment ago, maybe the elaboration of the code criteria and a bunch of documents that can be delivered. Adverse? Hardly. Target present? Ludicrous. Would it nonetheless be an improvement over the system that's described in the DOJ white paper? I don't know. <coughs> well, I just wanted to point out and maybe suggest that these legal questions have been dealt with by the Obama administration <coughs> through the drones program. This is what George W. Bush went through in detaining, um, detaining suspects, um, putting them in Guantanamo for years on end without trial, and then having many of those high-level suspects be released because there wasn't adequate evidence to actually put them away. And so Obama has dealt with it by not detaining them, not bringing them to Guantanamo, by ordering airstrikes. Um, and even though as the most reputable report says that in Pakistan, three children are killed for every one high-level militant. That's the way of getting around the legal argument. There's an argument that's powerful that suggests that the drone program is a, is a substitute for detention and trial. We don't capture them anymore, we just kill them. Matt? Or excuse me, Tom? Um, I think that's the argument that I've been hearing a lot of this by all people of uh, the Republican Party, um, more recently some like members of Code Inc. They say that this, uh, the, the drone program is um, hypocritical to the stance that the media and some politicians were taking on advanced interrogation. I was just wondering uh, if you had a, a response to the, the fact that killing someone with a Hellfire missile takes away all of your human rights and all of your rights in general because you're dead, as opposed to taking someone outside of the country and exposing them to advanced interrogation. You know, I think the, the piece of this that uh, resonates or that would be the basis for an administration response to that assertion is the capture feasibility one. Uh, it, it is true that individuals have been detained captured, uh, even though the United States has stopped taking suspects, terrorist suspects or insurgent suspects to the facility at Guantanamo Bay, uh, even while President Obama was attempting to close the facility, they've been, they've been captured and detained elsewhere. Some brought to the United States, some held at other locations offshore, including in Afghanistan. And if, you, if that criterion in the DOJ white paper from last week is taken seriously, I think it's a, it's a fairly persuasive answer to the assertion that this program is simply a substitute for uh, detention and trial. Go ahead. Just one more question. Well, there's, there's probably something going on here at 1 o'clock. Right. Yeah, for U.S. citizens, why wouldn't uh, issuing notice and then if they don't show issuing a, a default judgment on them not work. You, you have most of the components for a valid final judgment. Um, you mean like not paying like, your parking ticket? You yeah, you know, you, and you, you give them, you let them be aware that they're a suspect and if they don't show, um, the, the judgment comes down. It doesn't sound fair to me. It doesn't get at the question I think that, that you raised there with the, the hooded sweatshirt about what the facts are. The, the, the targeted person is not going to come out of hiding uh, under those circumstances, particularly if, if there's a lot of doubt concerning his, uh, his behavior, his predilections. If, as you say, with the appropriate uh, inquiry, you find out that he's really not the bad guy. It's a, it's a name identification problem or a facial recognition problem or some kind of misidentity. 
then it would be a, a risky uh, behavior. Uh, you tell me when we got to stop. I, I do need to stop just to allow people time to come into the room. I guess there's a class here in about seven or eight minutes. So thank thanks you for coming.